Praise God. Who deserves it? He does. Jesus deserves all the glory. Thank you very much, sister. Very melodious, as, as, as it was described. Um, you can have a seat. recognized me this time. Last time it didn't, so I guess God didn't want me to talk about that, but today I, I, I feel I feel like a confirmation, right? <laughs> confirmation. So let me just talk about the God of love, what I call the God of the universe. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I speak in tongues of men and angels, but do not have love. I'm only a resounding gong, a changing symbol. In other words, I'm just making noise. If I have a gift of prophecy, I can't fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge. And if I have faith to move mountains, but I don't have love, it's nothing. You know, you got to know who Jesus is, right? You, you know, you, you don't want to do his work and, and not know him. If you know him, you'll know his love. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give my my body to hardship that I may boast, that's kind of talking about if, if you martyr yourself, okay? And do not have love, you gain nothing. It, it matters why we do things. It, you know, God does everything. He can do everything, right? And there's always that little part of me that I have to go kill every once in a while, the part that wants to take credit, you know, and it's always there. And there's an altar there at your house. I want to take this time, small um, aside, I want you to pray for IYC. It's, the, it's a youth prison here in Illinois. Uh, Brother Adam, will you raise your hand? Is he out? There he is. Um, there's a few others that are going to be joining us soon. Yeah. Okay, and God, Jesus said to send them two by two. Right. And, um, you know, I've been going by myself. Now i got Brother Adam. You know, I, I feel the confirmation of uh, God has something bigger, and uh, you, we're praying, and I ask you to pray with us. Amen. You know, God said, I, I, I see what you're doing right and he says I've set up an open door that no one can shut he also said I really feel that especially these last couple of months I have so little power yet if I can keep his word and I don't deny his name. Sure. We'll do what the Lord asks, right? And he'll go before us. Because he has all power. We have no power. Brother Manley talked about, you know, what is God? Everything. We, we must decrease. He must increase. When this happens, we'll recognize that we, we, we actually are... He's carrying us. He's carrying us from place to place. So, you know, when I when I pray for IYC, you know, I, you know, in Matthew it talks about ask and it shall be given. Right, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and, and he that seeketh findeth. And him that knocketh it sh shall be. That means that we need to ask, right? It goes well beyond saying there is a God. It right. go, goes well beyond saying that I believe in God. Right? right? It, it, it's time to say, I, I trust God. I'm going to do what he says. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is faith, right? Yeah. And there's a second part to it. Where are you putting your hope? 
you know, I have walked through this life and, you know, there's been some detours, I'll admit. But, you know, I knew where my hope is. There's that narrow road, that's the, the wide road. Which one are you on? You know, if you're on that wide road and you know, and you know baptism, you know the Holy Ghost, you're always looking, right? You're always looking back. Well, guess what? Your father's calling you. Come back. The narrow road. Walk in it. I'll walk with you. So, love never stops, right? It extends beyond the gifts of prophecy, which eventually fade away. It's more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after with words of knowledge and forgiveness. Uh, and uh, are forgotten. Go, God's love transforms for their salvation in the name of Jesus, right? For he can transform. The heart, he can transform the heart. Yes, he, can. he can give us a new spirit, right? Yes. Are we walking in fear? God's not going to give you a spirit of fear. Let's exchange that fear for his spirit, a spirit of love, a spirit of power and sound mind. Love never fails. Love is Jesus. Jesus is love. We are commanded to love the God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbors as ourselves. God told us that, right? He told us what to love and not to love. We are not. We are to love God. We're not to love the world. For what agreement? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? You are the temple of God. All right, let's go cherish that temple. Let's cherish that place where, where God lives in us. church. I love you. God bless you. Amen. Would you mind standing one more time? Of course, before we stand for response to him, we're going to look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. He's saying about a covenant and a uh, I've taught on covenant many times, and in the Bible, back in the Bible writing times, there was a covenant, but a gift was always given to seal that covenant. Also, they spoke of Veterans Day, spoke of freedom, the cost of freedom, and I give honor to all of those that have served. Uh, it's a sacrifice, and it's a you never know. I mean, in a moment's notice, you could be on your way uh, onto the front line. So whether you've ever been there or not, you have made a decision that I am willing to go. We have some veterans that are not here today. I give honor to them as well. Look in Acts chapter 5, verse 31. The Bible says, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I noticed something about that scripture as I read it this week. He said, it does not say for to grant repentance or make it possible. It says for to give repentance. I will go into more on what that word means. But when you boil it all down the word give means a gift repentance is a gift it's a gift well that doesn't that doesn't sound normal an opportunity to tell God I'm sorry is a gift oh yes oh yes it is I want to preach teach this morning on the subject gifts from God gifts from God. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Lord, 
We always, Lord, we have prayed. We have, God, tried to bring our sacrifice to the altar even before the worship went up. And we worshiped you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But today we simply say, God, we've heard a scripture and we have an idea of the direction that it's going. We pray that our hearts would be open to you. God, that preconceived ideas, Lord, uh, resistance, Lord, that the flesh will provide. We pray against that right now. We ask that you give us complete, God, submission to your word and to your spirit as you move towards us and we would draw back to you as you draw nigh to us, that you will, your, you will draw nigh unto us as we draw nigh unto you. We pray for that, Lord. Bless the people in the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. So God said that that he would give repentance and he would give forgiveness of sins. And we talk about somebody giving a gift. And when we receive a gift, um, there are some gifts that we are excited about and others that we are not so excited about. Somebody can give you a gift and you say, oh, that's nice. Thank you very much for that wonderful. Let me do it a little differently. Thank you so much. I am so excited about that wonderful gift that you have provided. We can do the same thing with God. We can be very excited about a gift of healing. That's pretty amazing that God said a gift of healing. We can be very excited about a gift of healing, and yet the gift of repentance. Thank you very much for that wonderful gift. I appreciate you making that available to me. That's nice. I want to read in your hearing, uh, and I, hopefully they keep up with me upstairs. I have quite a few scriptures today, but Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, uh, and I would wait for all of you to turn in your Bibles and get there, but you can look at the recording and you can take all the notes you want. It's all, it, it will all be forever etched in stone. Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. This morning, early in prayer, I read that scripture as I was just going through the notes, organizing, making sure God wanted to say what I felt that he wanted to say. And a question or a comment came from me when it said, the soul that sinneth, and I said, well, we all sin." kind of a nonchalant thing. You know, everybody's a sinner. What's the big deal? He did not say that the person that sins, their body will die. The Bible says the soul, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So not only will death come to our bodies eventually, should the Lord wait long enough, but death will come to a soul. And I don't want my soul to die. This body is getting older all the time. And and it's uh, heaven's looking better every day that I live. Every ailment that comes, heaven looks even better. But I don't ever want my soul to get sick. And I don't want my soul to die. So the soul that sinneth, it shall die. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9, the Bible says, Know ye not that... Wait a minute, in 1 Corinthians, he's writing this to the church. You can look at me today and say, well, Bishop, I've heard that before. Well, do you think that the people in the church didn't hear that before? Paul was writing again to the church. He said, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, why don't you go and tell somebody that that pertains to? I am. He said, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There are principles that are taught out there that say, since Jesus went to the cross, that every soul that's ever existed will end up in heaven. It's not true. He said, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, you're getting my attention. Can we move on? Yes, we can move on to the next scripture in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written... 
There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And Paul to the Roman church said, there is none righteous, no, not one. Again, writing to a church. He wasn't writing to the people that are in the taverns and in the brothels and in the, you know what I'm saying? He was writing to the people that were in the church. And he said, there is none righteous. So people that are sitting under the sound of my voice today in a church building where the church resides, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now I'm getting nervous. Elder Williams, because if the unrighteous have no right to go to heaven, and the Bible says there is none righteous, you have my attention. And in Romans 3.23, just a few scriptures later, the Bible says for all, everyone say all, all. say that's me. But I didn't mean me, I meant you. It's the, see, you. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every one of us are sinners and are unrighteous. So to summarize what I've read so far is simply the fact that we are sinners. Sinners will spend eternity in hell. Man, am I glad I came to church today. <laughs> I'm so encouraged. Man, Bishop, why are you getting so intense? Because the trumpet's about to sound. That's why I care. <clears throat> and God is going to ask me to give an account for every one of you. Therefore, somewhere you need to be accountable. How do I give an account if you're not accountable? It's not possible. God spoke that to me last week, and I thought, well, that's kind of profound and simple at the same time. How, are, how am I supposed to be accountable if you're not accountable? God, I don't know what they're doing. They never talk to me. They avoid me at all costs. How do I know what God, I don't know. I try, but I don't know. How does that happen? <clears throat> so, in summary... We are all sinners. Sinners will spend, will spend eternity in hell. We don't have the ability to save ourselves. I'm not done. Save yourselves from this untoward. I know, I know. You save yourselves by obeying God and submitting to God and, letting, and, and obeying the gospel. So without God, we can't save ourselves. And without God, we can't unless we obey so based upon the five or six scriptures that I've already read, we have a major problem. We have a major problem. Hell is forever, so is heaven. Hell is torment, heaven is bliss, joy, freedom. I know that the Bible says God sets before us life and death, choose life, so we do get to make a choice. Where does that choice come in? So... I'm talking about, I'm just beginning to talk about repentance. We'll see where the Lord leads me today. But since we have a major problem, yeah, but I'm saved. Not yet, you're not. Do you feel saved from this world? I mean, I get born again of water and spirit, and I'm saved from my old sin if I keep repenting. But... I, if you're saved, you're not tempted anymore. I'm not there yet. I'm not in heaven yet. He's in the process. He saves us from the past sins through baptism. He saves us from current sin through the power of the Holy Ghost. But he will save us from future by the rapture of the church, by taking us out of here and removing us from the even ability to, be, to sin. So there are three, at least three phases. At least three I want that last one. I, I don't want pain. I don't want temptation anymore. I don't want anger. I don't want tripping. I don't want failure. I want to be saved from all of that. That hasn't happened to me yet. If you have, if it's happened to you, please see me after church and tell me how that happened because I would love to jump into that pool. 
But it hasn't happened to me yet. So if we have a major problem, the question comes, what shall we do? Well, I've heard that before. Peter began to preach to the Jews on the day of Pentecost and talked to them about their sin and their failure, their major failure of crucifying the Messiah. And they hollered out, I heard it this morning around the altar, I need your help, please help me. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? We have a problem. We prayed for the Messiah. We know we needed the Messiah because the current, the old covenant would never be sufficient. It's not even possible to walk in that covenant. It's impossible for man to do that. We need a Messiah. Please come. And he came and they killed him. And when it was brought to their attention that they killed him, they said, um, do we have any options? <laughs> wow, I messed that one up. <clears throat> what shall we do? And in Acts 2.37, that's where they asked the question. Peter's resounding answer comes back and he says, repent. Whew, I'm, glad there's an a I'm glad there was an answer. I'm glad Peter didn't say, I have no idea. Man, you guys killed him. I'm glad there's an answer today. I'm glad there's an answer today. <clears throat> At about 3 o'clock this morning... I don't know about you, man, there's, there are times that I can't sleep. I got up and I said, all right, I'm just going to go ahead and pray. And as I was praying, God said, when I, when I made the comment, we have a major problem. If you were on death row, you would have a major problem. There's a major problem. It's just a matter of days, weeks, months, but the inevitable. The inevitable is that you're going to pay for what you did. It's like having this sin in our lives and being a sinner and not being able to save ourselves. It's like being on death row. But as you're on death row, somebody comes walking down the hallway. Hey, buddy. Got something for you. It's right here. It's a key. I just gave you a key. Seriously? Yeah. I was given a key. The key gets me out of the cell, but not out of the building. That's what God said to me this morning. We can repent, and there are many people that jump up and down and say, Yay, I have a key. And repentance grants forgiveness from God when we repent, but it gets us out of the cell of unforgiveness, and we are forgiven, but you still, you, you can get out of that cell, and you can stand in the hallway and look, and guess what you're going to see? More bars. You're going to see bars, and you're going to see security guards, and you're going to, and you're going to be like, well, I'm out of my cell, but I'm not out of the building. But without that key... We're going to die. That's why Jesus said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. If, we don't, if you don't get out of the cell, if every other door was opened in that building, you'd still be stuck in the cell on death row. But repentance gets you out into the hallway. But you got to have it. But it doesn't set you free. It doesn't get you out of the building, but it gets you out of the cell. It's the beginning, but it's still important, and it's absolutely necessary. If they busted open every other door in that building and you were stuck in that cell, you're still not free. Praise God, or you're stuck in that hallway, I should say. The rest of the keys get us out of the building. But to lose a key is to lose our freedom. There are people that have 
been made aware of all the keys that God makes aware, makes, makes available in his word. He gives us. He said to Peter, unto Peter, I give you the more than one. There's not just one key to get you to heaven. The Bible says there are keys. Peter, what are those keys? What are those plural keys that get us out of the cell, out of the hallway, out of the room, into the free atmosphere? What is it, Peter? First of all, let's look at the dictionary for repent. It means to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. That's what Webster's says about repentance. But since Webster didn't write the Bible, let's move on. True Christian repentance involves a heartfelt conviction of sin, a contrition over the offense to God. I feel bad about what I did to myself, to others, that was wrong in God's eyes. It's a turning away from the sinful way of life and a turning towards a God-honoring way of life. That's what repentance really is. The world has given a misconstrued conception of what repentance really is. They simply say, please repeat after me. Wow. That's not here. That's here. My heart doesn't repeat after some, my, my mind repeats after somebody. But my heart, when my heart is affected, it opens up and it says, God, please help me. I'm lost and I want to be found. I sin and I don't want to. I'm lost. I'm going to hell, but I don't want to go. Please, please rescue me from this body of sin. I don't want to be in jail for the rest of eternity. If I ever pray with you, please don't repeat after me. I'm simply trying to help you understand what mode, what phase we're in as we reach out to God. But in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. I'm going to live a sinful life, and I don't want anybody to know. It says you will not prosper, but whoso cons- confess it and forsake it. Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. If we have to confess it to him. Lord, I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve the favor and blessings of God. I don't deserve that at all. I know that everything that I have done in my life would never qualify. Or anything I could ever do would qualify me completely for heaven. But disobedience wouldn't qualify me either. So help me to be as obedient as I can. Help me to shed the sinful things in my life by adding the power of your spirit, by by loosing myself from the record of sin and the evil and corruption that I grew up with, God, and help me to turn toward you and run to you and say, please empower me to live for you. Empower me to make right decisions. That's That's repentance. That's a desire to be more like him and to loose ourselves from the things of the past. But he said, whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. He didn't say if we just say, I'm sorry I got caught. Please forgive me. Let me come to heaven. But I'm still going to keep doing the things that I've always done. He said, you don't get mercy. Everyone in this room has a need to repent. Sometimes we sin of ignorance. There are times I came in the church and and all of a sudden I'd be like, well, I I don't, I haven't murdered anybody and, and I, you know, haven't done this and haven't done that. Praise God. And all of a sudden someone preaches and I go, I hope nobody's looking at me because, man, I feel guilty. Really? That's sin? Yep. Boy, I better not do that anymore. Well, I'll just, I'll just confess it and then uh, just do it again tomorrow. 
No, he said, he that confesseth and forsaketh it, there is mercy. Well, what if we don't confess or forsake? Then there's no mercy. Oh, you're pretty arrogant. No, I'm just being truthful and factful about the word of God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I'm sorry, i got to finish. Sometimes we sin because of ignorance. I just don't know. I didn't know about it. Sometimes because of our weaknesses. Lord, I, I'm trying. Look at Paul. I know I'm supposed to do this, and I don't. And I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I do. Who's going to help me? And you wrote half the New Testament? We're all in the same boat. There are things that we know we're not supposed to do, and we do them. And there are things that we're supposed to do, and we don't. Here's the key. Somewhere along the line, we need to make progress. Somewhere along the line, we need to be able to put a line in the sand and say, nope, I'm moving on, and I'm going to, do, I'm going to live for God, and I'm going to, I'm, this is going to be the exception to the rule, but I'm going to live for God. Things need to change in our life. If we don't forsake sin, there's no mercy. But there are other times that we sin because of willful disobedience. I don't care if he lights himself on fire. I'm not doing what he says. Willful disobedience can come. Ecclesiastes 7. There is not just a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Not one? Jesus hadn't come to the earth yet, so no, not one. There was one, but he's not here anymore in the flesh. But there isn't any. 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin, we're lying. And now there's sin in us. So what is sin? The simple, the simple answer is missing the mark. That's really what it means. So if we miss the mark, okay, well, I missed the mark. Well, I'm going to probably miss it again tomorrow. And I'll probably miss it again. And it was told not, not too long ago that if I'm shooting at a target, I just did this the other day. I'm a deer hunter. And I took out my bow and, and I was just checking, checking the sight. And when I shot, it was like six inches low. I didn't just say, well, I missed the mark. I'll just... Hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll duck as soon as I shoot or something. And I'll... You know what I did? I, I took the cover off the s- scope and I, and, I, and I adjusted it. I adjusted it and I shot again. And it was about four inches low and I adjusted it some more. It was low and low and low. And then, lastly, it was about an inch to the right. And I thought, that'd be close. Nah, let's do it. I adjusted it and moved it over. And the last one I shot was in the middle of the bullseye. Now, will that happen when the deer actually comes through? I hope so. Not always. But I've done everything I can do to adjust, to practice, and to adjust my sight to make sure that I don't miss the mark. This is what the Bible is talking about. He doesn't expect us to be perfect, but when we take a shot, and, and we're six inches low. He expects us to get out our screwdriver or Allen wrench and adjust and, and make some adjustments in our life so that we can get closer to the bullseye. And we keep trying and we keep trying. Hey, I did better today. But that requires us to forsake the way it used to be. But I, I've never heard that called sin before. Well, get used to it because we're getting close to the rapture. The Bible says that the bride will have no spot, no blemish. He said no wrinkle. God said, I'm coming for a bride that is pure and white. God said, when I come to that door and the trumpet sounds and, and that door opens and I look at you, if everything's not in place, you're not going with me. And that's why the intensity, and I'm not mad, and I'm not preaching against any one sin, and I probably won't mention any. But the point is, if, we, if something goes wrong in our life, or we begin to hear the word of God, and, and we go, you know, that kind of sounded, I heard something this 
just yesterday or day before yesterday, Prophet Shelton was preaching. I'm like, hmm. Boy, I'm glad I don't do that. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? <laughs> somebody <laughs> preaches, <laughs> somebody preaches, and they mention something, and you're like, Whew. man, that was close. But I'm glad I don't do that. And Pastor Jan said that one time he had, there was somebody sitting in the congregation, and they were stealing ducks. And the guy preached against stealing geese, and he said, that was close. I'm, <laughs> man, I'm, I'm glad. Man, I'm glad I don't steal geese. Get out your Allen wrench and <laughs> start adjusting. Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus' name. Sin, James 4, 17. To him that knoweth to do good. So we know that sin is to miss the mark. To, hi, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. He said, to him it is sin. He literally put a label on it. You want to know what sin is? It's when you know you're supposed to do something and you don't. Man, you didn't say stealing ducks. If you know you're supposed to do something and you don't, that's sin. <sighs> oh, man, I'm tired. What a list. <laughs> we missed his mark. And we say, oh, well, I was close. No. Be sincere. God, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I want other people around me to go. Help me not make allowances and say, well, you know, those other two arrows were pretty close, but this one was way off. Come on. Let's make adjustments. Let's, let's bring things together. Let's do what we have to do to make sure that we begin hitting the bullseye. Maybe not every time, but most of the time. God, I keep trying. I'm going to keep practicing and I'm going to get this right. First John 5.17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. What is unrighteousness? I know the first one that I read says that if we know we're supposed to do something and we don't, that's sin. Well, I don't need to interpret that one. But all unrighteousness is sin. And there is, so he said, unrighteousness. All right, what is unrighteousness? Adikia is the Greek word for it. And it means legal injustice, moral wrongfulness of character, life, or action. Iniquity, which means we follow our own will instead of God's. It's unjust and it's wrong. That's what unrighteous means. He said those things, wrong, moral wrongfulness, it's just a white lie, moral wrongfulness of character, life, or act. That's what unrighteousness is. And he said all of that is sin. 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. If there's something we're supposed to do and we don't, that's sin. Unrighteousness is sin. Sin is a transgression of, well, what is a transgression of the law? Word transgression is anomia, which is a condition of, it, it's the condition of without law. I don't want laws, I don't want the law to tell me what to do. I'm going to remove law. For, I, I'm not subject to the word of God. Be, it even says in Thayer's definition of the word transgression, it's, it says even because of ignorance to it. We can be ignorant to something, and he said, it's still transgression. Are you kidding me? That's why he said, study to show thyself approved unto God. Why do you have to study? To find out what transgression is. We need to find out what iniquity is. We need to find out what those things. Brother Jans looked at me one day, and he said, what is, what is law? What is transgression? What is judgment what is and he gave me all and to, to understand those are like in two scriptures they're all listed and i said he said what's the difference i said i don't know he said you best find out 
And he said, I'm going to ask you again next week what it is. Of course, I went and studied all that and found out what it was and came back and reported to him. And so it's important that we study, that we know what the Word of God says. We attempt to teach as much as we can here, but I can't be everywhere at the same time like Jesus can. We are simply teaching the Word of God and giving you the foundation of it. But we need to study to show yourself approved, not listen to somebody else teach it. You need to study yourself. What does the Word of God say to me? It also says contempt and violation of law. Well, <laughs> have you violated it? Well, I don't know. One guy told me, told Brother Yance one time, it'd be best if I didn't know what's in here. Nice try. No, it'd be best if you do know and you obey it. Because he said, what actually is sin? And when Brother Yance listed sin, and in that was adultery and drunkenness, which I knew he was doing both. He said, man, it'd be better if a guy didn't know some of that stuff. No, it'd be better if you do know and obey it. In Acts 5.31, like I read in my opening uh, scripture, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And in verse 32, so he's giving repentance and forgiveness of sins, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. In the message, God set him on high at his side, prince and savior, to give Israel the gift of a changed life and sins forgiven. A changed life. He called it a gift of a changed life. So he, they appropriated the word repentance to a changed life. Repentance is not just to try to get away from a penalty. Repentance is a changed life. It says then, and we are witnesses to these things, the Holy Spirit whom God gives to those who obey him corroborates every detail. In the ESV, he said, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. I looked up that word give, and it's ditto me, and it means to give. It means to give something to someone. If you were going to give me something, that means that I didn't currently have it, and it came from you. It was yours to give, so you give it to me. When God gives me repentance, it's not something that I already have. It's something that God has and he chooses to gift me repentance. It's simply, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, I am going to give you, I am going to give you a gift and it's called repentance. Well, thank you very much, but I'm really not interested in your gift. You better be interested in his gift because we have a dilemma. We are sinners and sinners will go to the lake of fire forever. We need that gift. It says of one's own accord to give one something to his advantage. 2A1 means to bestow a gift, to grant, to give to one asking. That means we're saying, I have a dilemma, I need help. And he says, sure, here's a gift. You need help, here's a gift. It's called repentance, to supply and furnish necessary things. This is all in the meaning of give, to give over, and lastly, to deliver. James 1.17 says, every good and every perfect gift. Notice the word. Every good and every perfect gift. Well, I'm so glad I have the gift of healing because I, I'm so thankful I've received a gift of healing from God. I'm so thankful I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those are easy because those are for me, literally. They, are, they help me live my life according to my wishes. If I get healed, then I can go. One guy, I mean, the prophecy came to him and said, the guy was like, I want to be healed. And I mean, a, prof a prophetic word came and said, if God heals you, then you'll be able to go out and do exactly what's in your heart. And it's not good. You best just keep that 
keep that disability so that you can keep salvation. Not all healings are good. Some healings would destroy us if we allowed them to come. So gift, every good gift. Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent, which is a gift. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, which is a gift. Yes, it is. It's a gift. Baptism is a gift. How do I know? Because he paid for it. He paid for baptism. <coughs> My blood can't pay for baptism. His blood paid for the remission of sins, which comes through baptism. He paid for that, and he said, I'm going to go ahead and give you that if you'd be willing to receive that. Well, I don't know if I want to get completely under the... Then don't accept the gift. But baptism is a gift. It is a gift of the washing away of your sins that you've ever done. And... You... <laughs> It can be completely removed. <clears throat> so he gives us the gift of repentance. He gives us the gift of water baptism in Jesus' name. And then he said, you shall receive the gift. Man, he's in a giving mode today. He wants to give us repentance. He wants to give us washing in baptism. And he wants to give us the gift of the Holy Ghost. But they are gifts, and a gift must also be received. You can buy me a gift, and I can say, thank you, but I'm not taking it home. with. I don't, I'm not going to receive it. How offensive would that be? That would be offensive if you gave me a gift and I didn't receive it. Well, how do you think he feels when he said, you need innocent, perfect blood to pay for your sins, so I'm going to go and ask Mary if I could borrow her womb for nine months to create a fleshly body with blood so that I can grow up, in, infuse that with the Spirit of God, and take that body to the cross be, just after it's tortured so that I can provide innocent blood so you can be free. Um, no thanks. Not interested. How offensive... I didn't die for you. I didn't give my life for you, although as a shepherd I would. A shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I don't have any problem standing in the way of a wolf. I am fearless when it comes to wolves that try to come. Just ask some of you. I would lay my life down right in front of the biggest, ugliest, Longest tooth wolf that tries to come and take you. I will put my life in his hands and say, God, help me. If a Goliath comes along, I'm after it. And I'm going to chop that head off after I've knocked him out. I'm not afraid of any wolf, of any Goliath. I'm not afraid. Hallelujah. For shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I need to finish. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then it was mentioned real briefly this morning by Brother War, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now there are diversities of gifts. Gifts. But the same Spirit. God gave gifts of the Spirit. He is in a giving mode. Gave gifts of the Spirit. What does that mean? When you look at gifts, charisma, the last part of that definition is a free gift. God gives us free gifts. Why? To negotiate the realm of the Spirit. To bless the church. To edify the church. That's what he said the gifts of the Spirit are for. Not to make somebody feel more prominent than somebody else. It's simply to edify and lift and bless and provide favor to the church. But also in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, and he gave... Guess what word that is? Ditto me, same word. God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. God gave spiritual leadership to the church. Same word. Man, I love receiving the Holy Ghost. Good. Same word. He gave pastors. Well, I don't need a pastor. 
Well, then you don't need the Holy Ghost either because it's the same word. But if you need the Holy Ghost, if you need repentance, if you need baptism in Jesus' name, you need a pastor. God gave me that this morning in prayer. He said, it's the same word. I said, I'm going to go look it up. I went and looked it up, same word. God said, I'm going to give you repentance. Well, I don't want to repent. Well, good. That's your decision. But God gave us a gift of repentance. He also gave us a pastor. And we need repentance just like we need a pastor. And if you don't like a pastor speaking into your life, you're not receiving a gift that God gave. Doesn't it say, and he gave some apostles. If you don't like the fivefold ministry, you're rejecting a gift from God. Mm. What is it for? For the perfecting, completing, equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The edifying. That's why God gave pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers, and apostles to the church. Hebrews 13, remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God. The gift of ministry that God gave to the church, I have a pastor. Why? Because God gave me one, and I need one. It says, whose faith follow. Remember them which have the rule. Remember them. It's actually mentioned twice in Hebrews 13. Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God. So it's not talking about God. It's talking about the person who spoke unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. We're supposed to follow their faith, considering the end of their conversation or their manner of living. Living, He said, the person who speaks the word of God, you need to follow them, considering the fact that they're going to have to give an account for you. The end of their conversation. And then he said, obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourself, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. And a pastor cannot give an account if you're not accountable. We have talked about accountability forever in this church, but I just found a good scripture for it. God spoke that to me just this week. He said, people can't be, they, you can't give an account of someone who won't be accountable. So if you want a pastor, which God gave you, you need to be accountable. Why am I saying that? Because I love to be a dicta dictator and a tyrant. And a, it's the last thing. Do you realize what hangs over my head? If you choose to be accountable to me, do you understand what hangs over my head? I have to give an account for you. Now you know why I don't sleep a lot of nights. I worry about some. But he said, we would like to do that with joy. And he goes on to say, please pray for them. Please pray for me. I carry a lot of weight. We give account unto God for you. And if I have to tell him I don't know, that's not on me. It's on you. And if I don't go to my pastor, it's not on him. It's on me. If he tells me something, I'm now responsible. That's what the Bible says. If you don't say something and they go to hell, their blood is on your hands. If I don't tell my pastor, if he tells me something, if he doesn't tell me, then my blood is on his hands. So repentance is obviously important. He said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. So we must receive that gift. Even though he said it's a gift, we have to receive it. We don't have a choice if we want heaven. We have to receive the Holy Ghost. He said, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you don't belong to him. He said that in Romans 8, 9, for the record, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You don't belong to him. So we have, you mean we have to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? Yes. Yes. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, then he's got nothing to revive you with. He said, if the Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, then you got that thing that will revive you and, 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 and give you immortality by the Spirit that liveth in you. He said, if you don't have it, I can't revive you. So we have to have it. Yeah, but it's a gift. Yes, it's a mandatory gift. These are gifts that you must unwrap and you must receive them. I am closing. Esau, he couldn't find repentance in Hebrews 12. 
Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance. He couldn't find it, though he sought it carefully with tears. There came a place in somebody's life where it says he wanted to repent. He found, if he couldn't find it, that means he was looking for it. So he was trying to find repentance, but he couldn't find it, even though he sought it carefully with tears, which tells me tears in itself is not repentance. It has to be more than that, because he had tears, and God said, well, he looked for it, but he couldn't find it. It has to be a change, a forsaking of sin. Isaiah 55 says, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel. That's us. We are the nations that ran unto God. It says, For he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. If he said, Seek the Lord while he may be found, Call upon him while he's near. He's near right now. Seek him while he... That means there's coming a time that he won't be found. There's coming a time when people will look for him and they won't find him. They'll cry out even tears, maybe tears of fear, and they won't be able to find him. Seek him while he may be found. In Noah's day, only eight people, only eight, made it out of judgment. In Sodom and Gomorrah, Four made it out of the city, but only three lived. Because someone turned around and decided that what what was behind them was more enticing to them than what was in front of them. If you'll stand with me, I'm going to read one last portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 18. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was explaining what heaven was like, and he said, there was a certain king which would take account of his servants, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents, way more than he could afford. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, here it is. Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. What a foolish statement. There's no way he could come up with that kind of money. Have patience. You mean like 4,000 years? Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. Here's the key. We can move God to pat compassion by our tears and our crying out. He was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Notice the words. Have patience with me and I will pay. It's the exact same words. The exact same words that that evil servant used just moments before. Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desirest me or cause compassion shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee look at, look at there's the key 
There's the key. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. I do believe the preaching of the past where the king removed the servant's forgiveness because the servant wouldn't forgive others. If we don't forgive, he won't forgive. I understand that. But when you look at the reason why he said it, he said, O oh, wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you asked me passionately. Should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servants? He said, the reason, I know you didn't forgive, but my compassion on you didn't change your response. It wasn't just the forgiveness. It was the fact that God's compassion on us didn't change us. We simply said, thank you very much. And now I'm going to go and treat people like I always do. I'm not going to change my sin. I'm not going to change my actions. I'm simply going to thank the king for letting me go but it's not going to change how I respond. The servant wanted mercy, but he wouldn't let it change him. True repentance does not regret parting ways with sin. True repentance doesn't say, I'm sure going to miss that ugly city of Sodom. I'm sure going to miss all that sin. I'm sure, man, do I have to do this? Do I have to stop sinning? Oh, this is horrible. All right, well, I want to go to heaven. That's not repentance. That's saying, I've got a debt I can't pay, but king, would you please give me some mercy? That's saying, I'm sorry, I got caught. But please let me come in anyways. True repentance hates sin. False repentance hates the consequences of sin. Do we hate the penalty or do we hate what caused the penalty? The Bible says we need to come to a place where we hate sin. I hate it. I hate what it does to people's lives and marriages and families and people's health. I hate what sin does. We bow our heads for a moment. Lord, here we are today hearing that our words, actions, thoughts that we entertain, whether it be ignorantly or willfully, it can keep us out of heaven. Thank you for identifying sin, what it is. Thank you. Thank you for drawing our attention, doing and not doing. But Lord, thank you for the key that will release me at least temporarily I can find forgiveness from sin but God remission only comes through baptism the word remission is not used in repentance it's only used in baptism but also thank you for the gift that you promised me the Holy Ghost but it's a gift that's necessary all these are I pray that you put inside of me a desire that wants to be right with you no matter what, no matter what anybody else thinks. I want to be right with you. I want righteousness to be covering me from you. I want holiness from you to be in me, developing me, working on me. God, bring understanding and desire to walk with you Help me to accept the word, not tradition, but the word. Help me, Lord. God is granting a gift of repentance today. A gift of baptism is available. A gift of the Holy Ghost is available today. For anyone that wants to receive, 
Paul said, I die daily. That means he repented every day of his life. I could have entitled it, The Gift That Keeps On Giving. We need to receive repentance today. We want to receive something from God. These altars are open. Gifts are here. Gifts of healing. Gifts of the Holy Ghost. Gifts of baptism. Gifts of repentance. Come on, if you haven't repented to the extent that you changed, you haven't repented. Come on, there's things that we've got to let go of. If you don't repent, and I don't repent, turn. I don't want to be like that anymore, God. Well, it's just who I am. That's why you need to turn. Well, it's the way I've always been. Good. Leave that alone. Put that thing in a grave. I don't want to be that way anymore, God. My way has led me away from you. God, there used to be a sincerity deep in my soul when I would hear the preaching of the word. Now it's just offensive to me. I'm just mad at the preacher again because he brought it up. It sounds like he's got a bone to pick. I just want you to go to heaven, that's all. Come on. God, if I'm not receiving the word, please give me a desire. Please give me courage to come up and say, Lord, I, I want to receive a gift from you today. Repentance. Turning me away from the sin in my life. Turning me unto you. Preparing me. Get me in the hallway today, God. Open my cell door. Open my prison door for me, God. Notice God didn't just open Paul's prison door. He opened them all. God can do that. But Paul had all the keys. Paul had all the keys. Oh, God, don't leave me in this cell room. Help me to break free. God, I need you. Come on, that's it. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You're coming soon, Lord. You're coming soon. We can feel it. The earth is groaning. There's a change in the spirit realm. It's getting more intense all the time. There's a disruption, God. It's not the same as always. It's just more of the same. No, you're calling your bride. You're pulling her close. She's beginning to feel the soon return of her bridegroom. Help us, Lord, to prepare our minds and our hearts, our lives, to receive from you, God. Come on, no matter what, we need to repent. You might, you might have repented. I repented multiple times this morning over this message. But I need to again. God. God. As David said, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. David said, if there be any wicked way in me, that means he wasn't even sure. He thought there might be, but wasn't sure. He couldn't even name it. If there be any wicked way in me, God, grant unto me repentance. Tell me about it. Help me to repent of it, God, because I want to get it away from me. I want to separate myself. Come on, you, there may be something in our life that we don't even know about, and yet we feel a bit of unrest. It would be good if we cried out. If there be any wicked ways in me, God, if there be any wicked way, God, wash it away in the blood of the Lamb. Wash it. Forgive. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. I want to be right with you. I don't want your spirit to depart and an evil spirit to come. God, I want to feel your closeness, God. I want to be right with you, God. Come on, that's it. Personal. Let your, let your talk to him be personal. Lord, I need you. 
you don't know how to pray, your heart does. There's something in your heart that's crying out. You can simply say, I need you. I don't even know if I'm saved, God. Somebody told me I was, but right now I'm not sure. Or right now I know I'm not, God. There's some things that have happened in my life. I know it's listed in that Bible somewhere, a sin. God, please, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Help me, Lord, to confess that to you. You don't need to confess it to a person, just to him. Lord, you know, you know all about yesterday or last week or last month. You know all about it, Jesus. Please, please, oh, please, please forgive me and help me to forsake it, God. Help me to turn my back. <laughs> yes. Help me to turn my back on that sin and move toward you. Like I'm pressing through a crowd of flesh, God, trying to get to you. I want to be close to you. I've heard that I can be really close to you, Lord, but I don't feel really close to you. In fact, I'm having trouble finding you this morning. Help me, Lord, to feel after you. And as I do that, I pray that you would ask me, help me to apologize for anything that might be standing between you and I. I know you might have heard this before, but there's people in this room that have not heard it before. You can read it in the Bible. They may not know where to find it. You go ahead and study it. But the visitor, the guest today, they need to hear it. A backslider who hasn't heard it for a long, they need to hear it. Someone who never understood it, they need to hear the word, the gospel. It's get sin out of your life by repentance and baptism in Jesus' name. And receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues so that I can have the power to live above that sin, temptation. Lord, thank you for making your word plain today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving it, God. Thank you for the gift, the gift, God, the gift of repentance. Precious gifts of the Holy Ghost. Thank you. Thank you. One day you're going to take your gift off the table. Because God, if we don't pick it up now, one day you may remove it. Esau couldn't find it. He looked for it, but it wasn't around, God. God, I don't want to wear it out, God. I want to seek the Lord while he may be found. Come on, seek him today. There's coming a day. The Bible says there's coming a night in which no man can work. Work while it is yet day. There are things that we have to do now while it is still daytime. But when the night comes, it's over. It's over. God, there's coming a time when it's over for us. There will be no more chances. There will be no more mercy. No more grace. Help us, Lord, to be ready. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, God. Let my heart be right with you, God. Let my heart be right with you. That's it. Just open your heart to him. God, I need you, Jesus. I want to make sure I'm right with you. Somebody told me that my lifestyle was okay, that he died for everybody, and so I'm going to go to heaven even though 
I'm currently living in sin. Oh, God. <coughs> Rebuke that lie. The moon, it would not hurt me. The blood won't sweep. God, we rebuke the liar. The soul that sinneth. If it continues to sin, it shall die. Somewhere, it's got to stop continuing. God, we pray. Help us, Lord, to turn from it. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, that's it. Come on, find a place. God, help me not justify. What will somebody think if I come to the altar? Who cares? I want one of those gifts, God. Why do we have to protect our pride? Well, he said there were seven or eight gifts, so... I'm just going to come for the gift of healing. Oh, God, we want to repent every day. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, God. Jesus, no one can I pray that you put a passion in my heart. God, put a desire in my heart for righteousness and holiness, God. Help me never justify my sin, my failures. Don't let me justify it. Help me run to you for your help. I need your help, Jesus. Hallelujah. No devil in Hallelujah. can lock what God has promised. Yes. Oh, God. Creator, healer. Come on, that's it. Don't worry what anybody else thinks. There is a gift. It is a key that he's handing you right now. Come on, right there. He's handing you a key. It's your, de it's your decision to pick it up or not. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. I want to receive that gift right now. There's more to go, but I'm not going to pass this one up, God. This one's being presented to me right now. I need this gift. I need it, God. Forgive me. Hallelujah. Yes. If you've already been baptized in Jesus' name, but have made some recent mistakes, do you realize that the key of repentance literally reactivates your baptism it literally washes away everything you've done since your baptism it's a key and you can lose it by sin but God will give us he said we can continue by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost he can renew that washing he can regenerate that washing. Thank you, Lord. You can be right with him by simply repenting. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry.